Hello and welcome to another episode of the Opus Well Style Podcast. My name is Ivan Watanabe here with my partner, Evan Wall. Evan, how are you, man? Doing great. Another beautiful day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're super excited today to have on a good friend of yours. So since he's your friend, why don't you make the introduction and, and kind of uh, kick us off? Uh, a long list. So uh, first of all, Mark Mark and I, uh, our wives uh, grew up together. So I get to see uh, Mark probably a couple times a year these days with our kids screaming in the background, yep. or at least my kids, your, your daughter's uh, a saint. So um, Mark is a, a network administrator, uh, handles all network infrastructure, networks, of software security. Uh, he's got an undergrad degree in computer science with a minor in computer crime and a master's of information security and digital forensics. He's a certified digital forensic forensics investigator. Now, the reason I know all that is because you texted that to me because I tried <laughs> Googling you and tried like prepping for this. And I couldn't find you anywhere on the internet. Is that, is that intentional? Are you like trying not to have any information out there? I, we're, we're Facebook friends. So I got you on Facebook, but not much there. Yeah, no. So um, yeah, I do. I do actually, I take, uh, I take quite a few steps to limit my online uh, footprint. Uh, it's just a good security practice. The more and more you have on social media, um, allows for a what they call a social engineering attack. Um, so the more and more things that you post online, uh, one of the most famous things was, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day, you know, you would go on like, uh, oh goodness, it would be MySpace probably. Um, and remember, you would get like those like 30 question long things and it'd be like, what's your dog's name? What's your favorite color? All of this stuff. What people didn't realize was, is that was actually hackers or bad actors or whatever you want to call them. Uh, gathering information on you so then they could go and then answer your security wow. questions wow. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that um still still to this day um it's one of the things that we train users to not actually respond to um because it just it's just you're just basically giving them the keys because they can just hit forget password and then start answering your random you know security questions and then boom they're in so Awesome. Well, so so that kind of brings us obviously we're getting right into it but the purpose of today's podcast is really try to um, educate the listening audience on what are the general threats around cybersecurity, right? I think it's for, for us, for most of people out there, we understand that there's a risk that's present and have zero idea mm -hmm. about how to protect ourselves. Don't really know what's true, what's not true. Some of us are just sort of like, I'm sort of like, you know, um, I'm just like, hands up. I know what I don't know. I'm assuming my, my identity is going to get hacked at some point. Yeah. Hopefully I can protect myself at some yeah. level. Um, but really just trying to sort of get the audience a little bit better educated on what they can do today. Um, and also like not make it so that I have to live in a bunker, you know, and I have to, you know, right. make sure that I'm off the grid completely. So how do we, how do we kind of do both of those things? So Mark, again, we're, we're excited to have you on today. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I'll, I'll try my best to answer those questions to the fullest and uh, hopefully you guys can interject and uh, provide some of your um, experiences because I can also comment to a few things that may or may not help you guys too. So, yeah. So keep in mind we're we're laymen as it relates to uh, IT. I I will call it, uh, and I imagine most most of our uh, listeners are as well. So, why don't let's just start at the basics. What what are the most common uh, types or sources of identity theft or cybersecurity from a from a personal standpoint, not necessarily from a business uh, standpoint? And then, you know, what are the at least basic steps that one can take to mitigate that? Sure. Yeah. So um, from an enterprise level, obviously, that's not what your use, regular user would be dealing with. Like you're not dealing with the random like attacks and things like that because you don't you don't have a lot of public information out there. Um, one of the best uh, if I was to actually uh, let's say well, we'll use Evan, for example, if I was actually going to try to attack Evan, um, the first thing that I would do is, is I would create what they call phishing email. Um, now there's different types of phishing emails. There's general ones, which are what most people understand is phishing. They're just emails that go out that randomly have links or, um, like, you know, Hey, click here, enter this information. Um, you know, it'll take you to a familiar website, like, uh, like a Facebook website, but maybe like Facebook spelled a little bit wrong. Maybe only has one O instead of two or a T instead of a K or something like that. Or I'm, you know, a Sudanese, to... Sudanese prince, you know, wanted yeah. to give yes. you some money and, you know, I'm just being extremely generous, yes. right? Those yes. kinds the, of things. The famous, the famous relative that you had that you never knew about right. son wants to give you $10 million, <clears throat> but you have to pay the tax on it or something like that, mm -hmm. but they need your credit card so they can deposit the the balance of the taxes in there or something like that. So those those are general phishing emails. Um, then more so like if I was to attack Evan, I would use a uh, spear phishing um, 
example of that. So a spear phishing email is a targeted email. So it would literally be addressed to Evan. Um, I would try to find something that would be like, I know Evan's big into baseball. So I would use like the New York Yankees. Like I would create an elaborate email that says, you know, you've won two, you know, premium box seat tickets to, oh, you know, the Red that. Sox <laughs> Yankees game, right? Yeah, definitely. You would click that. No problem. But the problem is, is now that now that I got you, because now you're willing to click links and things like that. And then you're going to click a link and it's going to say, oh, hey, Evan, for you to pick up these tickets, I need, you know, your credit card to secure them or something like that. Yes, they're free, but we want to ensure that you're coming because we could give them to somebody else. So that's the most common way. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe, um, let me grab a statistic here real quick. So right now, um, in, in the United States, 90% of, da of data breaches are conducted through phishing emails. So it's like something like 15 million of these things are sent a day to users. Um, most of the time, like Google, Outlook, um, various different emails providers that you use have a default filter set up that automatically look at like titles and things like that. And if it's like a known kind of phishing email that's going around, it'll, it'll like block it or at very least send it to your junk mail, which can somewhat help protect you, but it ultimately falls on the user themselves. Most people are the reason that they get breached in some way. Mm -hmm. so. And what about like from a home Wi-Fi perspective, like, is it is how easy is it for someone to get into i don't know my, like my my home internet or like should i be worried about like smart home devices uh, smart ovens and smart toasters is that is that you, is that a you should problem be, so um you should be terrified of those <laughs> uh you Seriously? should be absolutely terrified of them okay um so those devices are they they all have network connectivity they all have internet connectivity in some way shape or form and almost none of them have any type of security on them at all. Most of them don't even have a password or anything like that. So those type of devices are called Internet of Things or IoT devices is probably what people are more common to hearing around in lingo-ish terms. Um, so IoT devices like your, oh, let's see, like your toaster or your oven or your fridge that likes to make like your different lists and everything like that. Believe it or not, Alexas are the number one most biggest wireless spying device in the world right now. So you can go to Amazon and you can request your Amazon Alexa history and they'll actually give you a printout of every time that Alexa's recorded you asking it something or it's picked up what it thought was its awake word, uh, like Alexa or a variation of it. And it'll actually like they'll print out and it, and it like does like they'll send you audio files and everything. And it's like 10 seconds of a clip of an audio file of you saying something, whether you thought it was going to get recorded or not your Amazon Alexa is listening at all times. It's never not listening. Everybody's like, oh, I can put it into sleep mode or I can do this. It's always listening. It's never not. So they're literally, Americans are are bugging themselves. They're ta they're wiretapping their own homes willingly. It, it, it happens every day. So it's one of the scary things about an Amazon Alexa. It, it As convenience, as more convenience comes into your life and the availability to be connected and everything, everybody wants to be connected. Everybody wants... Uh, the term smart cities where, you know, everything is there right there at your fingertips and things like that. Like you can just, you know, think it and it'll happen. Basically, the more and more security is being compromised by that. So in something like a smart oven or a smart toaster, or whatever it might be, if it's hooked up to the Internet, if it had a password, is that would you feel more comfortable about using a device like that? Or because if it doesn't have a password, you know, it, it can, it can potentially be breached. Like what's, what's, what can we do to protect ourselves in that respect? Is there, or is it just basically if it hooks up to the internet, it is what it is. So without getting too technical and too, uh, well, it, it comes with a cost, but network segregation is really the only way that you can protect yourself against IOT devices. Um, generally, most people would set up their own type of router uh, from their modem. So if so, a lot of times when you get um, internet service, uh, ISP from, I, I don't know, Verizon, AT&T, whatever, um, they give you a generally a modem and router combo, right? And it has almost zero security on it. It has security for them, but not security for you. <laughs> it allows free access and everything. Like you might have a password um, and there's an encryption format, uh, WAP, there's WAP2, 3, there's, there's, there's many different types of encryption algorithms that come on to a uh, password. 
for your Wi-Fi. Um, it can use a different protocol like 802.11, 802.11c and a and certain things like that. But we're, we're getting down a real technical avenue here. Um, but generally, without network segregation, there's really almost nothing you can do to protect yourself against IoT devices. Um, they're, they're just kind of a major security hole in infrastructure. Um, so at an, in, at an enterprise location, um, like here at my at my position at Uniland, we have a completely segregated network for any type of IoT device that comes into our building. It can't connect into anything that is inside of our secure infrastructure for any reason. Um, it just doesn't go anywhere. It goes out to the internet and that's it. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything else. It can't, you can't cross talk over into other networks that we have segregated and stuff like that. It's realistically the only way to do it. Um, as to going to stealing Wi-Fi passwords and things like that, um, I have a little device, it's called a dolphin. I can walk into your house, turn on the dolphin, wait a second, and it's gonna pick up all of your SSIDs, it's gonna pick up your passwords, it's gonna pick up your usernames, it's gonna do all this stuff. It's a proximity thing, um, so there's stronger ones. Uh, there's certain things called uh, Wi-Fi pineapples. Um, they're used by um, what they call black hat hackers. Those are your nefarious people. Um, so what they do is, is it, it looks just like a regular Wi-Fi router, just a little bit smaller. Um, but what it has embedded in it is a malware that forces all of your Wi-Fi devices to disconnect from the Wi-Fi itself, from the network. And then when it reconnects, all of your devices come into the pineapple. And the pineapple then has a keylogger program on it. It steals the SSID, uh, which is your Wi-Fi ID. It steals the password to log into it. It steals your credentials. It steals any credentials that are on your machine that you enter. Uh, so it's really it's really an unsophisticated attack that anybody that has I think uh, I think about forty five dollars in some time can set up a Wi-Fi pineapple. And if you have a few different types of logging software, you can pretty much pull everything and anything. Um, so like free Wi-Fi at like airports, coffee shops, things like that. Very dangerous. You should never use it. Just stick with the data that you have, hotspot your phone and use your cellular data. I know sometimes it comes at a cost, but it's much, much more safer. Got it. And, and so, I mean, how do you, for something like that, right? Is there a way for us to protect ourselves at home? Like you know, the Amazon guy just dropped off a package, right? He could have mm -hmm. potentially have something like this, like in his bag and yep. hook up to my Wi-Fi and, and steal all of our passwords. Um, is there anything in particular that you can do at home that might make it more secure? No, not really, unfortunately. Um, like I said, with interconnectivity and the availability of Wi-Fi, it makes it it makes it very difficult to secure at your Wi-Fi network. Um, now you can you can do different things on your Wi-Fi router and things, but now you're starting to get more technical. You're going to start needing somebody that understands networking and protocol management and things like that. But as a, as just a general home user, not not really. If somebody wants to steal it, they're going to steal it. Um, it. I, I have a, I have a story. I was, I was living in an apartment complex at one time. And it was when I first started my cybersecurity career, I actually started playing around with uh, Kali Linux. It's an offensive Linux hacking tool, basically. Um, it's used when you're, when you become a certified pen tester and stuff, it's used in the correct manner and stuff. There's a very fine line between white hat hacking and black hat hacking. Um, but I accidentally, I ran this, uh, I ran this program. I'm not going to say what it is because you can basically search it and look it up right online. And then you can just plug it right into Kali Linux and it'll work. Um, but basically what happened was, is I was living in this, I was living in an apartment complex. Uh, there was probably 30 people in the building. I ran this program real fast. It forced everybody to disconnect, brought everything back up. And I had everybody's SSID and Wi-Fi passwords for my whole complex. Uh, so it's, you said by accident. By accident, I, <laughs> I was fumbling around. I made a, you know, so I went to one of my professors and I told him what I did. And he was like, just get rid of Kali Linux. <laughs> he was like, reimage your computer. And if the FBI comes knocking, you don't know who I am. So. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's why, you know, what Yvonne was mentioning earlier, which I, I, I feel as well, it's like, what, first of all, we're, we're layman when it comes to, to IT, the, it almost feels like, inevitable that all of our information probably already is on the dark web. I know that's certain for my parents who use mm -hmm. the same password for everything, regardless of how many times I tell them not to. That, and, that's, you know, man. so it's like, you know, what, what are you, what are you going to do? Just like try to live your life and ho hopefully, you know, credit cards and everything will, will have fraud protection or, yeah. you know, have, have multiple different, you know, complex passwords. But other than that, you know, it's a, it's a tough area. 
Yeah. So the nice thing, the nice thing is, is what I tell everybody is, is if you can use your credit cards, uh, try to use your credit cards because mm-hmm. credit cards have the credit, they have the fraud protection. Um, now most bank cards, um, most ATM cards and things like that do also have fraud protection on them. So you're pretty safe there. But as far as using one password for everything, man, that is no, that is a definite no-go. Um, what I suggest to users that are like that is, um, you should you should use the suggested generated passwords mm-hmm. um like every time you set up a new account or something like that like if depending on what web browser you're on like google or whatever they'll give you these like 18 character long passwords that make no sense to you at all and then you can use a password manager store those and just have one solid strong password for that password manager and that's the best that's the security best practice that you could ever do on that is is there um, a password manager that you recommend i use password one um that that seems to be pretty good. Um, now, whether or not you know, there's there's a million of them out there. You can pay for them. There's free ones. Everything. It's all it's all you know. It's it's buyer beware when it sure. comes to password managers. There there's no law that says any company has to disclose publicly if they've been breached or not. Um, so like I know like IBM went through a breach and it cost them like four point eight billion dollars or something like that. And this this was just like last year. So like IBM was breached. Sony was breached. Um, you know, and the only reason that they, the only reason they even said anything, because they were publicly traded companies and they had, yep. you know, they had a, you know, the expenditure for the stockholders and stuff like that. So they, they had to come out with it, but there's, but there's plenty of private companies out there that could breach all the time and they never, they never report it. So, uh, it's kind of buyer beware. Um, password one seems to work pretty good. Um, you know, you could always, uh, you know, you could, you could technically, you know, do your own research and find one that you think is better. It's all on what you want. If you want to pay for more features and stuff like that, that's in, that's entirely up to you. I'm a big open source guy, so I like to use free stuff. Um, I recommend using free stuff. It's usually the best. It just sometimes lags in security patches, or if, like I said, if they get breached, they don't have an obligation to tell you. So gotcha. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because we were having this conversation a couple of months ago, and you know, I, I I saw I don't know if you, the name rings a bell, Frank Abagnale from that movie, Catch Me If You Can, right? So yep. I, I saw I don't know how true or not his story is, um, but you know, I saw him give a presentation. I want to say like seven or eight years ago, and his one of his the big takeaways was one, don't use a debit card right at all ever. That may have changed since then. The other part was always use your credit card if you're going to pay for something because of the the credit or protection and and all those kinds of things. And the other thing he said to me was really interesting was or said yeah, said to the room was the most expensive identity on the black market are children because yes. if their if their identity were to get stolen, you know basically you'd have 18 years worth to to sort of sell it off or do all these different things or open up accounts. Um, until it was discovered, right? So, you know, their identities are critically or or super valuable versus ours. You know, we'd probably find out in 15 minutes that it was stolen because I'd get an alert somewhere. So, you know, I don't know if you can speak to that or what your general thoughts are and some things that you people can do to sort of protect themselves and their kids. Yeah. So uh, credit reports, credit reports, credit reports, constantly check your credit report. (laughs) Don't rely on that one year thing where you get it for free. Get LifeLock. Uh, well, I shouldn't be pitching LifeLock or anything like that, but that's just that's just a common one. Get some type of credit monitoring so that you constantly know what's going on. Um, that's that's the best way to stay on top of what's happening as far. Um, but there was a so not too many people are familiar with this one. Um, there was a major credit card breach at Wawa. So there's not a lot of Wawas where I'm at in Buffalo, but we have um, we we do have some chain stuff. But I know down by you guys, like New Jersey and Pennsylvania stuff like that, Wawas are huge down there. Mm-hmm. So something like, I think it was something like nine or 10 million credit card numbers were stolen yes, for years, us. right? For years, years and years and years. They, they were in the system for like four or five years Crazy. and they had a tech come in and look at one of the credit card scanners. And he just happened to notice that they were there. Like he just, he was looking at certain things and he just happened to notice like uh, data being exported out of their network, out of their servers and stuff. And they traced it back and they found it. So right now, out of the Wawa breach, I think you can buy, they sell them in packs on the dark web. You can buy a pack of, I think, like 100 credit card numbers for like five bucks or something like that. Wow. So yeah, I was I actually got trapped in it. My my credit card actually got stolen 
uh, my debit card. I was down in PA doing a training and I went to a Wawa and I swiped my card within that time frame. And uh, sure enough, my, my card was stolen and they used it. And I just, I, I mean, I hadn't had no reason to get a new debit card from, you know, X to Y. And, uh, you know, and it just so happened that one of my credit card, my credit card was, it was inside of the attack. There's not really, it's not really a ton you can do when it comes to that stuff. I mean, obviously there's the fraud reporting and going to your bank and, yep. you know, yep. hopefully your bank is going to be understanding and then just, you know, refund you the money and everything. And then they have certain people. Um, one of the things that I do, I, I do uh, not, not necessarily so much anymore, but I was, um, as I would comb through forensic data and just find all of this stuff, pull down images and root through all this random data that you would think would be nothing. And then it ends up finding the, you know, the start and end location of it. And then they would produce that report and everything like that. Um, it, it, it's financial sectors is obviously it's where the money is. So they're the highest target ever. Um, just a generalized person, not so much. You're probably going to get caught up in the spear phishing or the phishing email or mm -hmm. uh, the new thing that's out. I love this one. It's called smishing, believe it or not. Uh, so smishing Crazy. is where, yeah, I don't know if you've ever got the text from uh, yes. the random Nigerian prince now. Yeah. Um, so now he's apparently texting. Um, <laughs> but like a lot of banks, like they'll, they'll send you a text message and be like, oh, there's a problem with your bank, but it comes from like a, like an 840 area code or something like that. And you're like, what is this thing? And people respond to it all the time. And uh, you'd, be, you'd be amazed what you can get to people to give you um, right over text messages. They'll give them their whole account number, their password, Crazy. everything. I so get a lot of text messages of like, reporting uh not reporting uh tracking a sh a, a you know a, a a box that uh mm -hmm. you know uh, something that we that we bought and obviously we get like five you know boxes a day so it seems rough but i'm you know <laughs> unfortunately i'm not not that uh dumb enough to click on these links but you know for a lot of people it, it looked like i i almost i think about i was like oh no this kind of looks legit maybe I, yeah. and then i'll go to the website and and see yeah. if there's anything wrong and never the case but mark what do you think about uh <clears throat> texting and, and emailing sensitive information like your social security number <laughs> um should people be concerned about that um so social security number no social security is not um even considered pii anymore so that's personal identifiable information why is um, that social, so the social security administration got breached uh every american social security number is out is out there everybody wow. has it yeah most companies most companies don't even use social security numbers to identify um, people anymore. They use employee ID numbers or um, they use like a, some type of unique identifier. Social security numbers are like, they're, they're not even considered. Like when we, we set up databases and things like that, like you used to have to like um, encrypt stuff and things like that is in, encrypt some data. Um, it's not even PII anymore. Wow. Um, yeah. It's, it's, and it's almost predictable because um, yeah. You know, they they once they learn the pattern of all the different numbers, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just connecting the numbers to people and stuff like that. And it's kind of like the Wawa breach. They're just they're selling them off in blocks for next for pennies. Um, but yeah, it's it, the social security number was once like this high exalted number that was out there, but now it's not so much. Now they're more after your what's your favorite color, what's your dog's name, hmm. um, those type of things. Um and now with the advent of multi-factor authentication, mm -hmm. um, that's now the new standard. So Got most it. companies now, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar, because, uh, I, well, I actually, I don't know what industry you work in, Ivan, but I know Evan works in the financial industry, which I assume that's probably yep. what you do. So now most most companies, when you go to log into any type of network or infrastructure, you guys probably get like uh, maybe like Duo or Microsoft Authenticator or something like that, or you get like a dongle. Um, and you have to enter like a six digit code or you have to mm -hmm. use like a phrase or something like that that's texted to you or something like that. And that's that's how they're that's how they're getting past all of this, like social engineering and the stolen ID numbers and stuff like that. So the industry is taking <clears throat> large steps forward. Um, but MFA has even been breached. Uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. Authenticator had a breach not too long ago and they they stole a bunch of credentials out of there. So not, not nothing's perfect. Yeah. But just in, in jet like even if it's not so security if i don't know i guess that's like i don't know that's the most secure thing that i could think of but like <laughs> texting in general is that like how yeah. how easy is that for hackers to get into my phone and see i don't know what i'm what i'm doing in there so getting into the phone is hard um any any iphone from 12 above mm -hmm. has not there's no backdoors well the backdoor hasn't been found yet mm -hmm. i can't say that there's no backdoor apple might have created one 
but nobody's been able to find it. Um, everything 12 or everything below 12, there's a program called Celebrate that allows any forensic investigator that gets a hold of your phone, they'll they'll crack it in about three minutes. They have to You're physically right. have the phone though. They just have to have an image of the phone. It could be uh it could be a backup, like a data backup file of it or anything like that. They can mm. put it into this. There's a sometimes it depends. If it's just like if it's an online file, they can just run the program against it. If it's an actual physical phone, they'll plug it into a device and then use the device to crack it. Um, but phones, phones are not as easily able to get into because of biometrics. So like mm -hmm. your face opens your phone mm -hmm. or your thumbprint opens your phone. So those are those are very difficult to get around. Uh, it's the pass keys, like the the six digit pass key, the 12 digit pass key and stuff like that. Those are the ones that are easier and easier to get around. Um, Texting itself is not secure. SMS information is not secure. So if you send a text message, anybody can read that text message if they have the right um, equipment to pull down data signals. So anybody that has like, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the device, but I can't, it's escaping me right now. But there's a device out there that hackers can sit up, it can set up and it puts out a fake uh, Wi-Fi signal or not Wi-Fi signal, a data signal, basically. Um, it's looking for, uh, it's a, uh, it's called an MZ catcher. So it's basically a fake MZ catcher. Your phone syncs with it, sends all the data, downloads all the data right to the MZ catcher, and then the guy just plugs it right in and produces a Word file with all the information on your phone. So um, SMS is not the best. Um, everybody hears about WhatsApp. I think that's like the most common mm -hmm. one. WhatsApp mm -hmm. is actually unsecure. It's been breached. Uh, the federal government has had a backdoor into it for like the last like seven or eight years at this point. Um, the Chinese Communist Party got in when they had the, the whole thing in Hong Kong. They were reading WhatsApp messages that people thought were secure, and they were reading uh, the, the different correspondence between the people there in Hong Kong. Uh, so you have to be really, really careful about what you send. Um, people like to think like Snapchat is like a secure thing or, uh, yeah, yeah, um, like because it disappears in like 10 minutes. Sure. Um, one thing you have to understand, if data sent, to some type of device or through some type of app, it's stored somewhere. So some server somewhere has your data on it and it is 100% readable by that administrator of that network, so. Got it. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to find secure uh, email. And believe it or not, the best thing to do is, is to just write it on a sheet of paper and hand it to someone. <laughs> no, <laughs> or, it's well, a phone, super low-tech. I'd analysis. imagine a phone call is, uh, has gotta be pretty secure, right? Yeah, yeah, phone calls are harder to get into. Um, yeah. They're not not as easily breachable, but they are. It's 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 very it's it's easy to get. Um, so unless a lot you of have times, Alexa in the room, then you're yeah, then you're yeah. then, then you're right. in trouble. It's a good point. You even say a variation of that word, and it's yeah. and it's recording your whole conversation. Um, they're a little bit easier to. They're not as easy to get into, but um, with the if you can because you can build an MZ catcher for about five bucks. Um, it costs about five five to ten dollars. I mean, inflation is hitting us right now, so. Um, so we'll save 10 bucks, um, go to Home Depot, buy the correct, uh, the correct equipment that you need. And you can set that up and that has no distance limit. Um, you can sit anywhere and any phone that decides it wants to connect to a network will ping your MZ catcher and you have all the information on the phone. There's no security between an MZ catcher and your phone. Um, it's, it's just the way it's the, the system is designed because then it allows your phone to validate and then connect to the, the wireless network, uh, either Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, whatever. They all use MZ catchers um, and they're all universal. So an MZ catcher is not set up for different carriers. There's not different um, security protocols or parameters on them. It's just a one and done thing. And every all those networks connect into the MZ catcher. So. What, Mark, what's your, so, you know, obviously we're, we're moving into a world potentially of, of sort of, you know, auto you know self-driving cars you know evan's got a tesla right so you know self-driving cars and hovering cars and all these other things you know i am petrified of somebody taking over my car and driving me off the road somewhere you know i don't know if that's a real fear i should have that's or absurd. you know how that potentially could work but you know as we get more and more and more um, sort of linked to technology and things super automated, you know, where do you think you can protect yourself or how do you do that? Or, you know, what are your, what's your general take on it all? Um, don't buy a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really the know stock has just dropped. Mm. Uh, no. So Tesla does take quite a few steps to secure their uh, systems and stuff like that. The, the problem is, is that one man on the ground with certain tools can capture anything they want. Um, 
the Teslas are vulnerable to being hacked. Any car is vulnerable to be hacked. Um, any most most cars now have OnStar. Most cars have Wi-Fi. They have all these different things that are embedded in them. Um, and it's not hard. It's not really hard to hack. One of my classmates wrote um, his thesis on hacking uh, Teslas and hacking certain types of other different cars and things like that. And he proved that um, in like 10 minutes of him standing in a bar and um, just getting, he was getting random people to show him his car keys and hit the unlock button, right? Just, just joking around. Like um, he had a whole spiel where he would, you know, talk to him, get him laughing and everything like that. And in his pocket, he had a, he had one of those dolphins and the dolphin is going to read that signal that's being sent because it's just a radio signal. The problem is, is most of the time, what people were thinking before was, is that when you hit the unlock button on your car, that as long as it didn't reach the car, it wouldn't work. Well, this dolphin then intercepts that radio signal. And now it has that code that until it's actually sent to the car, it's still good until the car sees it and then goes, oh, okay, I'm going to unlock or I'm going to lock the code's still good. So what he would do was, and then he would take that code out to their car, put the dolphin into transmission mode, and then it would unlock the car. And then he would get in the car. And because he had three or four of these different codes, then he would get in. And if it's a push button start, he would push the button with the dolphin in transmit mode and it would start the car like the key was in the car. Because the car has no idea that the key's not in the car because it's getting the correct codes. It's being sent on the right frequency and everything like that. So the car believes that it's good and then it'll drive away. So um, you see this a lot with like garage door openers. Um, some of them function on the same code and wavelength and everything like that. So someday you might be driving down the street and just like start tapping on your um, garage door opener and you might open one of your neighbor's garage doors. There's only a certain amount of codes on certain amount of frequencies and things like that. So hacking cars is not really a difficult thing. Once again, like I said, you can force it if it is connected wirelessly to, you know, like a cellular signal or something like that walk by the car with a pineapple send in that malware that forces it disconnect and reconnect and then now you have the systems of the car self it's not gonna you can't like obviously physically take over the driving of the car i mean we're not to that point yet i mean i don't know evan might evan might take a nap while he's driving and let the car go but um not yet not yet, not yet. i don't think i could i don't think i could do that uh but there is still the physical you know steering and pushing of the gas and things like that so taking over a car is not really realistic taking over the systems of a car though is um turning on and off the radio messing with the gauges uh turning the lights on and off disabling the ignition and stuff like that those are all possibilities once you hack into the systems of the car got it i'm guessing yeah. uh the security industry has changed a lot over the last few years <laughs> and i'm sure will continue to i, I think i saw recently Google, I think it was Google mentioned uh, that they're trying to get rid of passwords for more biometrics. If I if I caught that correctly, um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Just kind of just summarize. I don't know real quick what the changes you've seen in the security industry, and then maybe if you any, any thoughts on where you think it's heading. Yeah, so um, MFA is one of the biggest things that's been rolled out everywhere. Um, biometrics is all almost all of the hardened facilities. That do anything with the government uh, either require some type of thumbprint or some type of like unique identifier and then a, like a retinal scanner or something like that. Um, it's definitely going that way. Uh, pretty soon biometrics is going to be the only thing out there. Um, the password is dying. If you don't have a 16 to 17 digit or character password at this point, um, the supercomputers are going to crack it eventually. Um, what what's scaring me now as far as we're moving is quantum computing um, mm -hmm. as quantum computing comes in um, algorithms and cryptology can't keep up so uh, right now um, with the advent of AI and things like that there's studies out there right now that say that if a um, AI machine was told to crack uh, the standard of SHA-256 or 258 sorry or sorry 256 so it's a it's an album it's a algorithm it's an encryption algorithm that uses a very large prime number to get to a key. And um, so if you use this very large number to get down to one number and then it unlocks the system. They're saying predictively that AI could defeat that in less than a second. So almost, almost there's almost no chance that encryption is gonna survive AI. And we're gonna have to come up with an advent of like quantum encryption or something like that. Um, now that's not like 
I'm no expert on AI, uh, but that's I don't see that happening in the next like two or three to five years. But um, people that are much smarter than I are definitely worried about it. They're talking about it. They're doing studies on it and things like that. Um, Encryption is going to be very difficult at once AI becomes more so. Um, a, they say AI thinks at 20 to 30 times the smartest person right now in the world. Um, the, the capacity that it has is so untapped that they don't even, it codes in a different language than what humans can even understand. So it's all it's all going to go, I, 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 there's going to be some very exciting and very frightening times when it comes to security in the next five to 10 years. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, now that I'm thoroughly petrified of leaving my house <laughs> yeah. um, and, and while in my house yeah. uh, from the Amazon Alexa, that's listening. So, so, you know, as we kind of wrap this up, right. You know, I think the listening audience could use just a couple of pieces of ways to protect themselves. So I heard you say sort of get, get a password protector, right. Something like password one, mm-hmm. um, the a life lock or something along those lines to just generally protect yourselves from that space. Um, using a credit card, you know, when you're making purchases, are there any other basic things or things that you generally recommend that you, either folks don't know about or that you implement yourself that you really recommend for other folks? Yeah. So um, <laughs> my, my wife gets on me about this all the time. I change my passwords every uh, 30 days. I change every single password. <laughs> sure, I that must drive her crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, it go, it's insane. Um, so I change my password, change your password often, change it often. I can't say that enough times change it often don't when you create a password don't use anything from your childhood don't use your street address don't use your kids names don't use your birth dates don't use your anniversary don't use don't use anything like that try to formulate at least a 16 digit long um password with special characters uppercase lowercase numbers try not to make it formulate a word that's the best way i can explain to create a password um, other things that I do is, is I limit, I have, I have quite a bit of social media. It's just hard to find me. I do things where I don't put my phone number on my social media. I don't put, um, my birth date. I don't, um, I use different, I don't use my full name. I use a variation of my name, things like that, that, that helps secure your, um, social media. Also, it makes, um, it makes it difficult for your employer to find you. Um, most people don't think of that when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, most times, um, people's employers like to look up who they are, or what they're doing in their personal time. Um, it's not it's not so much a cybersecurity aspect, but it's more just a security aspect in that sense that I just don't want people to easily find me on there. Um, I check for scar- card skimmers on all ATMs. I check for card skimmers on, um, when I go to the grocery store, I pull on the faceplate of the little card thing there. I check the buttons. I make sure something doesn't look out of place. Um, you, so you, just, you, you just like grab it and wiggle it around? Is yep. that... Yep. Mm-hmm. So when you go to, so like if you go to an ATM, grab hold of the part of the port where you put your credit card in and give it a yank. If it comes off, it's a skimmer. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't, it's properly installed. The same thing with gas pumps and things like that. Um, tap to pay is one of the worst designs and features that they ever added to a credit card. Um, tap to pay uses what they call near field transfer NFT. Um and it allows, uh, there's a chip that's embedded inside of your card, other than the one that you see on the outside, that with it gets within, most of it are like one to two feet away from something. And it makes a connection with a reader, and then it downloads all your credit card information, and it allows you to pay for your gas or something like that. With the advent of COVID, a lot of things became like that, just tap to pay or thing like that. Apple Pay, Apple Pay is horrible. Apple Pay is it uses near field transfer and everything like that. You get near a receiver and it tries to prompt your phone to use your Apple pay. It's the same thing with Samsung pay or any other type of like digital, like payment source like that. Yeah. Apple requires you to use your biometrics sometimes, or even Samsung. I'm not really sure because I don't own a Samsung phone, but I think it, I think it does use biometrics or it requires a passcode or something like that, but the passcodes and things are easily broken. I know that the biometrics on my wife's phone can be opened by my daughter. My daughter picks up my wife's phone and it sees her and it thinks it's my wife and then it unlocks the phone. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if Charlie gets near, uh, Charlie wants to buy something. She can just unlock Amanda's <laughs> phone, walk up and uh, just use the tap to pay for it. Nice. So you got to be careful about things like that. Um, uh, those are the biggest things that I do. Uh, I, I, RFID wallets, um, credit card holders, things like that. 
Um, they have devices. There's devices that HI that can read HID sources just by walking up to you. And every you know, and everybody thought, well, oh, they got to be close enough to bump into me or something like that. No, that's not true. They can steal um, un unprotected cards from like four to four to five feet away or something like that, depending on the strength of the receiver that they have. So RFID is a big, big thing. Um, buy a wallet that has it. If they're not, they're not super expensive anymore, and they're very, they're they're everywhere. Um, you know, you gotta you gotta be cognizant of that. Um, I don't answer, I don't answer text messages or cell phone calls that I don't know. Hmm. Um, emails, phishing. Uh, the new thing out now is the browser attack. Um, we didn't really talk, we didn't get too much into uses of a browser or anything like that. Um, one thing everybody that I that I should make very clear is, is that um, browsers like Google Chrome, Edge, Firefox, whatever one you're using, are super unsecure. No matter what you're doing, they themselves are super unsecure because they're just by nature, they're easily accessible and easily usable. And they get a lot of what they call uh, site injection attacks. So you'll be you'll be on like a legitimate site and you'll click something and it'll have a invisible overlay over the site. You'll click on it. And next thing you know, you get a pop up window. Maybe your speakers will come up and say, oh, your your computer's infected. There's a virus. Call this number. Don't ever call that number. Microsoft is Jesus. never going to contact you that way. And that's 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 something that I'm seeing a lot on my users here at work and stuff like that. And in, in general, um, my wife actually got one of these. She was, she was using uh, Google Chrome and she got a, it, she got hit with a browser attack and it told her that her whole system's infected, that she needs to call this number, that her computer's locked out, all this stuff. She calls me panicking and I'm like, I'm like, babe, that's, that's a virus. That, that's not even a virus. It's, it's literally, they just, they just took like a small little piece of JavaScript, injected it into the code for the website it sits on an overlay that you can't see. There's no way to protect yourself against it. Yep. And you click and you click on something and you inadvertently click and open this link. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't affect your computer or anything like that. But what they're trying to do is get you to call this number. And then you're going to get on the phone with the Nigerian prince. And he's going to tell you <laughs> that I need remote access to your computer to, to deal with all of these problems. Your computer's completely infected. Get on and turn on remote desktop. And then tell me these, and then tell me the passcode in these numbers. And you think like, as we're sitting here talking, I can see it in your guys' face. You're like, oh, there's no way I would ever do that. That would mm -hmm. never happen, right? I can tell you, it happens all the time. I and then next thing you know, they're in your computer, they're in your bank account, <laughs> they're in your emails, they're pulling down sensitive data. And it's not just financial data that they can steal. They can steal, you know, uh, any type of legal or maybe like family planning or anything. And no information is useless to a, to a hacker, none of it. It's all useful to them. You know, like you guys work in the financial sector. I work in the IT sector. If somebody gets in and gets my super user password, they can move through my whole network with no problem. Mm -hmm. And they'll steal all kinds of data. No data, no information, no nothing is useless to them. So, so that that's it, that where Amanda got th that website. It was the solution that she just had to X out of the browser and that was it and she was fine? So it actually covers your browser and you can't actually do anything. It, it So... I haven't seen the script yet because as soon as you realize it and it's it's set up, it disables like some of your peripherals, like your mouse pad and stuff like that. So you can't do anything. So it gives you the illusion that your computer's completely locked out. Just hold down the restart button. Let it restart. Let the computer recycle. It'll come up and then you can go to the browser and it'll be fine. Because it's it's kind of like a one and done thing. Got so it. it's not it's not a persistent thing because once you reload the website, it reloads the code that like Google or Microsoft or whatever has implemented. So the, the injection attack's not there anymore. So it, there, th there's not really a way to protect yourself against that, but just try restarting your computer. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't give somebody access, you're probably okay. Um, once they get your credentials or you let them in, if you give somebody remote desktop access into your computer, it's over. They got everything. They're going to they're going to immediately lock out the controls for you. And then they're just going to take control. And all you're going to do is sit there and watch them take whatever they want. So Got it. even if you shut down your computer, you can shut down your computer. But the problem with that is, is um, sometimes they can disable the fact that you could shut your computer down or they can keep the remote session open. Um, depends on the next how time fast they are. Open it up. Yeah. Well, the, well, they just, so like you'll, you'll try to shut your computer down, but it won't actually shut down the instance of the remote desktop connection. Mm -hmm. So they can keep your, so they can keep your computer open. 
So it's, 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 it's hard. It depends on how fast they are. It depends on how good they are. It depends on, you know, what, if they really know what they're doing or not, or, you know, they're just in a large center of, you know, like uh, you see this a lot in like Reykjavik, North Korea, stuff like that, where they just have massive, like, I don't know for a better word to call it like a call center, but it's all just people trying to like hack into computers and stuff like that. So you may get one of the guys that's new that doesn't really know what they're doing, or you might get somebody who's really good at it and they might be able to lock you out of the computer as, as fast as you give them the information. So it's, it's very, it's very difficult to protect against those because you as the user are the weak point. So. Well, incredible. Mark, listen, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, this is, this is a great conversation. It was super interesting. I'm, I know the listening audience took a lot away from it. I certainly did. Um, we really, really appreciate you being on and, um, to you, the listening audience, thank you for, for tuning in. Make sure you click subscribe below. Uh, but again, guys, I, I really, really appreciate the conversation. And Mark, uh, thanks for being so uh, so transparent and and, uh, and and generous with us. Yeah, glad to, glad to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Anything I can do to help promote cybersecurity to people, I'm willing to do. So Appreciate it, Mark. Thank you All so right. much.